Welcome again to the course on effective speaking. In the last unit of module 1, we looked at how language works like a symbol and it's like among a variety of symbols that we use to communicate. In this unit, we look at how words work, the power of words and how to select the right word. I begin with a small quotation in Urdu to uh, drive home the importance of words and the elusiveness of meaning which words are not able to capture. Ho rahi hai baat kuch aisi jisme shabd gum hai arth matlab chupke se kho raha hai. Ho rahi hai baat kuch aisi jisme something is happening whereby shabd gum hai we lost for words. Words are disappearing. Arth matlab chupke se kho raha hai and meanings are lost. So what I said yesterday how difficult it is to catch meaning because meaning is so elusive and how inadequate words are to capture meaning. Let's look at another Sanskrit quotation which says more or less the same thing. Arthashraya atvam shabdasya drashtur lingatvam evacha tanmatra tvam chanabhasu lok Shanam Kavayo Vidu. Persons who are learned and who have true knowledge define sound as that which conveys the idea of an object, indicates the presence of a speaker, and constitutes the subtle form of ether. So, from the elusiveness of words and the elusiveness of meaning, which is impossible to catch in words. We come to the Sanskrit theory of sound in which uh, sound is very important in capturing meaning as important as the word itself. With this opening, let us look at, let us come down to business and look at how words work. First of all, we need to see that words are belong to different categories. Some words are functional words and others are content words. What are content words? Words which carry meaning, nouns, adjectives, principal verbs, they are the content verbs. And what are functional words? Functional words are words which, which do not carry meaning, but which are very necessary to indicate relationships. So, indefinite pronouns, uh, conjunctions, prepositions, the uh, auxiliary verbs are all functional words. Then we look at the difference between words which are connotative and words which are denotative. So, the meaning of connotation and denotation in words. What is connotation and what is denotation? Some words are denotative and in science and engineering whenever we want to uh, whenever we want to express things clearly, we try to use denotative words because in, the, in denotative words, the word means has only one meaning or it has a very small range of meanings. So, take a word like if you look at an object in front of me, there is a table which has four legs and it is got, it is made of wood, it is got a um, it is got a rectangular plank and it has four legs and we understand this object to be a table and this is a denotative word. But if you say table the minutes, then we are not using it in a denotative sense. So what I am saying is that even denotative words can be used in a connotative manner. When you say, okay, uh, take a seat and we are looking at a chair. But when you say someone is in the hot seat, then it is a connotative usage of the same word seat. Denotative words are largely used in science and engineering or in business. Wherever clarity is a goal, we tend to use denotative words. But 
in other spaces we tend to use we uh, uh, can use connotative words because it connotative words have many nuances they have several shades of meaning and they don't have only one mean, meaning they can have metaphorical meanings they can have a range of meanings so generally poets creative persons writers tend to use connotative language when we are expressing our emotions then connotative language is more appropriate than using denotative language let's look at uh, robert uh, burns's famous line my love is like a red red rose that's an brilliant use of connotative language because uh, for centuries people have been trying to guess what did robert burns mean by this line those of uh, those of you who are interested in poetry who write poetry or who like to read poetry you can see what the pleasure that you get by cracking the meaning of a poem because the poem has no one meaning it has several meanings so as in this line what does burns mean does he mean my love is like a red red rose so love is an abstraction uh, which is compared to a rose which is otherwise a denotative word we all know what a rose is but in this usage rose stands for something it's a connotative word which doesn't mean literally a ro rose it means a rose but it goes beyond a rose so rose in general usage in the west rose is associated with beauty so what does burns mean does he mean his love is very beautiful or is he talking about when he talks about love is he talking about the emotion of love or is he talking about his beloved so is he saying that my beloved is like a red red rose is he saying that his beloved is very beautiful so th this is to illustrate how connotative words may be used to create a range of meaning now there are situations in which connotative usage may be used for denotative purposes and the interest it may be used to create uh, by using connotative words to create denotative meaning now i am going to narrate an incident an anecdote about uh, listening to a newspaper vendor screaming a headline from that day's newspaper so i'm talking about uh, uh, several decades ago and i'm talking about my childhood in srinagar yes srinagar before it became became the most dreaded place in india and it was paradise on earth but i was in school and from my school bus i heard a newspaper vendor scream haseeno ne jawano ko tabah kar diya haseeno ne jawano ko tabah kar diya which is urdu an urdu newspaper and the, literally it means uh, beauties have devastated young men now can you guess what happened the the newspaper uh, vendor the the young newspaper vendor who was trying to sell copies of the urdu newspaper was surrounded by a huge mob everybody wanted to get their copy of the newspaper because they were, you know it was a very sensational headline and everybody was very curious to see what had happened how did the beauties just devastate the youth and then came the anti climax because what was the headline about it was about the class 12 results in which girls female students had scored higher marks than male students so think of this very creative writer of the headline who used a very everyday news about the class 12 results to create interest in his readers by using connotative words connotation to create interest in his potential readers and his potential buyers the second way we distinguish words is on the scale of abstractness versus concreteness what are abstract words and what are concrete words we tend to use a lot of abstract words in our uh, everyday usage and whenever i ask people to to uh, 
to spell it out in concrete terms, I find invariably people substitute one abstraction with another abstraction. So, say a word like happy, happy. A word like happy, which is an abstract word. Now, when I ask people, what do you mean when you say I'm very happy? They would say, I'm very contented, I'm very satisfied, I'm very thrilled, I'm very excited, uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, ecstatic. So they are merely substituting one abstract word with another abstract word. Because abstractions are very difficult to describe, they are very necessary when we, we, we do need abstraction and we find that as uh, civilizations advanced, as people tended to use less concrete language and tended to use more abstract words. And they say that uh, it, it's a myth, but they say that primitive, primitive, the so-called primitive people, or the savage people, or people who belong to oral oral societies, which who we met earlier in Ong's definition, do not have a capacity to use abstract words because they tend to think. Even their thinking is in concrete terms. So abstract words came with the invention of writing, with the distance, uh, with the birth of individualism. So the capacity for, this is the belief, uh, this theory is con contested, but I am trying to say that abstract usage, which is very common, it came later in, in the evolutionary scale, is believed to have come later in the evolutionary scale. And it is very difficult uh, to get somebody's meaning when they use abstract terms. We tend to use abstract terms, but when someone says, I am very happy, what do you what does that person mean so a person has got a very high paying job and that person says i'm very happy the other person says i'm very happy you look very happy or says i'm very happy so what does that person mean he means that he's he's been he's gone on a holiday and he's feeling relaxed so unless a person tells you what they mean by happy, you have it's a guessing game. You don't know what, what he means when he, he or she means when he says I'm happy or I'm sad. You don't know what what the emotion is there, but what what is this state of being happy? Philosophers have been trying to guess to interpret abstract terms for centuries and they haven't succeeded. Words like compassion, like the Buddhist term dukkha. Karuna. These words people have been debated for debating for centuries, but they are s such high-level abstractions that it's impossible to guess what these words mean. Therefore, in when you when you desire clarity, it's better to avoid abstract words and to use concrete words. So, if I were to if if you were to say I am very happy if I can sleep for eight hours a day. Or if I am very happy if I score 99 out of 100 in my class test. Or I am very happy uh, when I am with my friends. So then that abstract word becomes very concrete. Otherwise, it can create misunderstanding between the sender and the receiver because the sender can mean one thing by happy, whereas the receiver will understand happy to mean something else unless the sender states clearly what they mean by being happy. We talked about strong words. I give you another example. So you say, I am very angry. Now angry is a very flat word. When you were a child and you did something naughty or even as, an, as a young adult, you did something which was not approved by your parents. So suppose you have a curfew on going out on late nights you are a young man or a young woman, but you still have to follow a curfew at home, that you cannot, you cannot return home after a certain hour at night or a certain V hours of the morning. So imagine, so your mom has been, your mother or your family has been waiting for you for dinner and you have dinner at 9 o'clock and you, end, you land up at 10 o'clock because you've been having, you've been uh, hanging around with your friends, you, you get back at 10. And what happens? Your mother serves the food or whoever is there serving the food serves the food but is very enraged, not just angry, they are enraged. 
I suppose, instead of 10 o'clock, everyone waited up for you till 10 and then they went to bed and you turned up at midnight. What would happen? Everyone's come out to open the door for you, but your dad is infuriated, absolutely infuriated. And let's think of the next situation where it's past the midnight and you've been partying hard and you land up in the wee hours of the morning after having told your parents that you'll be back by midnight and four o'clock you find your mother's pacing up and down the room or your dad is pacing up and up and down the room and he is livid. So see the difference between enraged, infuriated and livid. It's very flat to say just angry. You have to use the precise strong word. Yesterday I talked about familiar words that always use familiar words which are normally short words but I also told you that some familiar words, some short words are not familiar words like the word so of which we use uh, in relation to certain kind of people who are very well dressed, who are very well, who speak very well, who are very refined. We use the word so of but it's not a word familiar to most people. Short words, we instead of saying a lot of people try to, end, try to use very complicated words, long words. So instead of saying, I am very happy to see you, they say, I am elated to have encountered you, which is just complicating very simple words into very complex words. Concrete words. Yesterday we talked, uh, in the last unit, we talked about concrete words and uh, how when you use abstract, low, lower level abstractions, it creates confusion. So if you tell your worker that he, has done a, he or she has done a good job, the worker is very confused. What do, I, what do you mean when you say, oh, you did a very great job, you did a very good job? Did he mean that I did the work in less number of hours than it was expected? Did he mean that the work I did was, ex I mean the quality of the work I was uh, expected to do exceeded the expectations of the, my boss? So instead of saying a good job, you, you say, you know, the, the, the report that you prepared, it was written very succinctly and very brief, briefly and it was, uh, it was just the right length. So if you say very clearly what was good about the job, that helps to bring more clarity in your speech. Active words. We also distinguish between active and passive words. So the normal English sentence is an active sentence. We tend to use active words more often than passive voice and words in standard English. So the normal sentence is John likes Jane. Whereas in Indian languages, we tend to use the passive more often. We would say the equivalent of Jean is liked by John. Instead of saying John likes Jean, we'd say Jean is liked by John. We use the passive voice. So passive voice brings less clarity. Because we translate from our languages, we tend to use the passive voice more often. So we would use words like, I mean, this is an actual usage. It was decided that the communication course will not be taken by the HSS department. This is an actual statement from a resolution which was sent by a certain department to another department. Instead of saying the HSS or so and so in the HSS department will not take the communication course, instead of that uh, no blame was assigned, names were avoided, no responsibility was taken and passive voice was used which is often used by bureaucrats to avoid blame and responsibility to say, uh, to say that it was decided. Who decided it was not mentioned. It was decided that the communication course will not be taken by the HSS department. Cliches. In the last uh, lecture, I talked about cliches as phrases or uh, words which, which are used when they were used for the first time, they seem very appropriate, they seem very unusual, very unoriginal and they attracted interest. But since they captured everyone's imagination, everyone began to use the same cliches so that they lost their vigor and their originality. 
And when you come across these cliches, you find journalists using a lot of cliches. Now remember, journalists have deadlines. They have to deliver their copy. They have to deliver their article before the newspaper goes into print or nowadays even before the news is uploaded online. The, they are working under a lot of pressure and they tend to use cliches because it helps them to compose a report very quickly. But for other people, when you, when you pepper your speech with cliches like within this time frame, the bottom line is uh, um, or um, uh, above and beyond, things like that battle lines are drawn, it gets very irritating because you are using words which have lost their vigor. Now, camouflage verbs is another example I had given that instead of using nouns, instead of using verbs, ma many of you use, us use the passive voice and whenever we use the passive voice, we tend to include verbs turned into nouns. So, instead of using verbs as verbs, we turn verbs into nouns. These are camouflage verbs. They are actually verbs, but they are used as nouns. And they tend to make a, a speech very confusing. So, a sentence like this, adaptation to the new rules was performed easily by the employees. We have two problems here. One is that it is a passive voice. It was performed easily by the employees. Uh, the second is we have a camouflage verb that is adaptation to the rules. Ad adapt is turned into a noun. So, instead of saying the employees easily adapted to the rules, it is made more complex, more uh, confusing to say adaptation to the rules was performed easily by the employees through the use of camouflaged verbs. Eliminate unnecessary words. When you are speaking or writing, try not to use, try to use one word. When one word can do the job, do not use three words. Uh, eliminate unnecessary words. So, many of us I have come across people using, there was a consensus of opinion on this matter. Now, consensus itself means opinion. I mean, it is based on opinion. So, you do not have to say consensus of opinion, you can just say consensus. Or you would say from my past experience, experience is always in the past, it cannot be in the present or in the future, it is always on what you went through in the past. So, you do not have to say from my past experience, you can just say from my experience. Avoid obsolete and pompous language. Now, we tend to think that words like Latin words or structures, very formal structures uh, sound very impressive. But these are words which we have been using for uh, since the British Raj and these words were in usage at that time. But over a period of time, over the uh, centuries since the Raj ended, English language itself has evolved. It is a very dynamic language. So, in England, no one used this kind of language which was used by the British when they were in India. Whereas, we are holding on to the language that the British left us with, particularly the officialese or the bureaucratic language. In our bureaucracy, we are holding on to these phrases and sentences uh, which, which are obsolete, which are no longer used in the native by native speakers, words like as per your instruction, we wish to advise that. And um, I am very um, um, amused and um, surprised that even my, even I, when I have to deal with bureaucrats, if I frame a letter in a very simple English stating clearly what I want, I am instructed by someone in my office. Uh, someone in the administration who advises me or who corrects, who edits my letter by using words of this kind, obsolete, because it is still use, is still standard language in the Indian bureaucracy and it is considered appropriate language. So, I would be told, please write as per your instruction, because or as mentioned above, 
or uh, for necessary action usages which are no longer which are out of date elsewhere in the world because they sound very pompous remove unnecessary modifiers so example is tremendously high pay increases were given to the extraordinarily skilled and extremely conscientious employees what are the modifiers tremendously and high extraordinarily extremely these are modifiers now instead of saying tremendously high pay increases you can just say high pay increases or astronomical pay you can use just one word instead of using unnecessary modifiers were given to the extraordinarily skilled extraordinarily skilled is redundant extraordinarily is redundant extremely conscientious extremely is redundant you can just say high pay increases were given to the skilled and conscientious employees that's all removing hedging sentences now hedging is a trick we use whenever yeah, uh, in the last unit i said whenever you state whenever you make a statement you make it sound like a fact even though it's an inference so hedging is a very good strategy when you are not sure about something and uh, to use hedging or to use hedging sentences or words it helps to bring some tentativeness it helps to bring uh, a less uh, it makes it less generalized or less of a fact and more of an inference but when you are very sure that something is a fact and you use a hedging sentence it's very irritating so suppose someone has entered an office illegally and there's evidence of that you try to hedge by saying it would appear there is obvious evidence that somebody has entered illegally but you would say it it would appear that someone apparently entered illegally there are there are unmistakable signs that someone has broken into the room so if you hedge and say it would appear apparently it's very irritating eliminate the indefinite starters is that there are this is new learners of english tend to use indefinite starters there are four boys in the room there are several examples here to show that elaine cannot hold a position very long you don't really have to say there are you can just say several examples here show that elaine can't hold a position very long present ideas in parallel form my young my uncle bill is young ambitious and he is rich now this is not correct because you have to say my uncle bill is young ambitious and rich you don't have to say he is rich awkward pointers words like as mentioned above the afore mentioned the former the letter again my administrative staff loves to use these awkward pointers and edit my letters by saying you have to write this as mentioned above the afore mentioned and i meekly obey them because i want to get my job done bring the subjects closer to the verbs trudy when she first saw the bull pawing the ground ran it's very confusing because we don't know who ran trudy or the bull so if you say trudy ran when she first saw the bull pawing the ground we know who's ran whether the bull or trudy but when when you want to create ambiguity like in this poem it's better to keep the modifiers and to use uh, sorry to to let the subjects be not be close to the verbs like in this line running down the railroad tracks in a cloud of smoke we watched the countryside glide by now this is a very beautiful poem and it captures that idea when you're in the train you don't know whether you are running or the train is running or the countryside is running that that feeling of the countryside passing you by as you are uh, you are in a train so that gives you the impression and this use of the dangling modi modifier running down is it the train running is it you running the countryside running we don't know but it creates that beautiful impact which the poet wants to create so i'll conclude with the golden rules use one syllable words rather than two syllable words so in in other words use short words two syllable words rather than three example blood sweat and tears rather than sacrifice perspiration and sorrow use graphic rather than abstract words scooter rather than vehicle jackal rather than animal 
use the active voice rather than the passive. Not the tire was fixed by me, but I fixed this tire. Lean on the verbs and nouns, reduce adjectives and adverbs, use strong graphic verbs. Example, Ravi wrestled with the problem, a well chosen verb makes an adverb unnecessary. Relate the experience to your listener. Example, if for fishermen, then refer to fish, wind, net, sea and sand. Every language has its own music. Check your word to see whether it has the correct sound. Thank you.